Seth Fader's on Stun, let's go. This is Penn Sunday School. And we're off! Sisters, siblings, welcome to Penn Sunday School, starring Penn Gillette. My name is Mike Ludo, Matt, Randy Ridge, Penn and I are broadcasting from our separate homes in Las Vegas. This week we have the amazing author of Human Smoke and Mezzanine and other great books. On past episodes you've heard Penn rave about his writing, we've tricked him into talking with us here today. The great Nicholson Baker's on today's episode. Here he is preaching love, Mr. Penn Gillette. Uh, Nicholson, welcome. I uh, I said before uh, uh, before we were rolling that you were my uh, favorite author, who used to fill me with joy, and now just bum my shit. <laughs> and uh, you are yeah, still my favorite author. You know, um, uh, one of the things that's so um, fabulous about being young and listening to music is that when somebody puts out an, an album that you would never buy, but you're a fan, like, you know, Bob Dylan puts out Nashville Skyline, and you right. go, I don't like country music, but it's Bob Dylan. And um, I've really lost that in music, but I have it with you. You know, I yeah. fell madly head over heels in love with you, with the mezzanine and room temperature and you and I and Checkpoint and Vox and all of that. And when you started writing more of the um, nonfiction stuff mm -hmm. that was more history and more, uh, more of that, I, uh, I would never have read that, never in a million years. But I had fallen so deeply in love with your writing that I went along with you. And uh, it's a kind of expansion of my thinking that I really have uh, sincerely not seen since uh, since Bob Dylan, and I also <laughs> think because we're um, we're the same age, you know. Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, we talked about this. We had lunch once. We talked about this in the mezzanine that the topical references, uh, mm -hmm. like when you're reading Moby Dick, you you can have no idea what those topical references mean. And uh, I knew that you were a little troubled by the references in the mezzanine that are gone, the drugstore that chain that no longer exists and so on. Mm -hmm. But being the same age, uh, those go directly to my heart. And there's a whole other kind of, kind of beauty to that. Um, uh, in the mezzanine, and I'm, I'm just going to say this again, you're talking about all your, or all the characters' inner thoughts. And uh, there's the one moment where you say that character says every time uh, he sees vitamin C, he thinks of the Grateful Dead uh, living on reds and vitamin C and cocaine. All a friend can say is, ain't it a shame? Which I have thought every single time <laughs> I've seen vitamin C. And it was probably one of the most magical moments I've ever experienced in art. You had absolutely successfully read my mind. Oh, uh, I, I, I don't know where to start to say thank you. You, you, are, you are a perfect reader. To go with me to the dark places when I had promised people that there would be only light places and then to have you say it's okay is just a, it's a thrill. And, um, as far as the vitamin C and cocaine, you know what? I, when I heard that, I thought, well, maybe that's possible. You know, maybe we could live on vitamin C and cocaine. <laughs> I, 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 I was, I think I was in high school or something, but it just, <laughs> I, I'm always just looking at tools for living, you know, tips. Yeah. You, and I you think and Linus Pauling <laughs> fell for that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I was going to say, do we run the fact checking now or do we wait to put it in the notes <laughs> later? He, he um, it worked for him. I mean, I guess he'd already gotten the Nobel and then he started to pop the vitamin C. Yeah. And maybe there was cocaine, maybe there wasn't. We don't know. <laughs> but you know, uh, I want to really address that because the, the light and dark places are not different. Um, what what you're always 
what you're always looking for in art, what I'm always looking for in art, is a glimpse into another human being's heart. You know, what's, mm -hmm. what's deeply in there, which is also, uh, tools, uh, tools for living. And it also is something, um, you said, uh, and I'm, I, I'm sorry, I didn't intend to, to quote this, so I will not quote it right. But you said that every novel answers the question, why should we stay alive? You said something yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Why, why, why is life, is life worth living? Every yes. book, every book should be an answer to that question. Or, or, or at least give, give, give us some, give us some pieces, something to chew on about that. And that, uh, that has not changed in your writing at all, not even slightly. And the glimpse of who you are and the, and the gentleness and the love and the peace is, uh, equal in the mezzanine and in, uh, and in baseless. Um, it's, it, it's all there all the way through. Yeah. Somehow in baseless, we can still like you, <laughs> <laughs> which is not. Pleasant book. <laughs> Even though I'm talking about brucellosis and yellow fever and yeah. and the uh, and the mosquitoes and all that, the worst nature in humans, and yet you're still showing a side of you that's delightful. Well, that's really incredibly kind. I think the idea is to find. I'm always looking for things to be enthusiastic about, you know, just in a primitive way, and also people to admire. And so it, it, when I write about a very dark period, like, for instance, the run-up to World War II and the early phase of the war, I want to find the people who were saying sensible things and things that, are, that were heroic and difficult to say. And the same thing was with this book is, you know, the, not everybody was saying, yeah, let's cook up the nastiest, ugliest bugs and then make them resistant to antibiotics. That's what a lot of American scientists were doing. But, but some people were saying, no, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> you know, and, and the, there was a bunch of them, in fact, who stood on a, um, on a corner outside of Camp Dietrich in Maryland for a year withholding signs saying, this is not a good idea. And, the, and so I, I wanted to offer a book that might not just be a complete downer, but would have moments where people who are much better people than I am, much more patient and determined, were able to do things that actually changed policies and made made the world better, you know? So we should um for the audience just give a uh not yeah. you, Nicholson, you wrote the book. Uh yeah. someone else should, I can't talk I can't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> should should just say exactly what the book is about. What is the book about? Because I have been trying to figure that out. Well, it's, it's, it's going through the Freedom of Information Act and looking back on a lot of uh, heavily redacted uh, documents that take forever to get and that everyone's stopping you from getting and trying to piece together some of the um, horrible things that we, if, if we can all be Americans or we as humans, mm -hmm. are capable of doing to each other. In mostly what Nichols is looking at is the um, biological, uh, more biological than chemical, but biological and chemical warfare, and mostly around the Korean War and uh, the, the CIA and, and Cuba and South America. Uh, and, wow, uh, that's it. Well, that's that's true. <laughs> and, there, and and yet somehow there there are dogs in there as well. Do dogs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that and dogs. Ben That's what I loved. <laughs> I thought that was so important. Like every time I really was like re overwhelmed with the weight of the horrible information I was taking in, you'd talk briefly about your dogs. And I was like, <laughs> look, the sun came up, you know, like another day begin. <laughs> oh, thank you. And wow. what pastry you're eating when you're in the library. Going through. <laughs> <laughs> that was my favorite part. That was my favorite part of the whole book, the pastry. Yeah. I love a crunchy baked good. I mean, I can't, I had to, I had to write about, it. well, the idea was, yeah, to, to write it as a diary was a sort of experiment. How, cause history usually is presented, you know, roughly in chronological order or thematic order or something. And the historian has gone to many different places and figured stuff out at different times in his or her life and then put it all together. But what if you, uh, 
sort of live through the struggle of writing history. You know, uh, uh, sometimes you think about Cuba in 1960, maybe. Sometimes you think about Korea in 1950, and you just bounce around. And I, I did that because I had tried to write. I, I have written chronological books. I know how to do it, I think. But I couldn't do it with this one. This was just too, it was too much stuff. And one thing would lead me back. And I'd say, well, in order to explain that, bit of craziness, I have to go back to this one. And and then I would say, well, then I have to explain it with this one. So I was always going back in time when the whole idea of writing a book is to go forward in time, if if my fingers are pointing correctly. (laughs) So so it just it was it was impossible. So then I suddenly realized I'm writing about all this animal experimentation. um, And we just got two middle-aged dachshunds from the Bangor Humane Society, and they're very lovable, you know, and, 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 I, and I sort of, it was sort of like a gift. Why not write the book beginning with the, with the dogs? Because, you know, there were so many, so many things done to animals in the name of germ warfare in the 50s, and, and, and it just seemed like we need to think about how much an animal's face can teach us, you know, how, how much they can say by looking at us. I feel like we need to think about how much we hate guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> we oh, really fucked over a lot of guinea pigs. <laughs> we did. We did. Yeah. There was a, there was an experiment that I don't even, I don't even want to, don't even get me started on the experiment of the 2000. But you know, guinea I, pigs. I, I want to talk, uh, uh, one of the things you do, um, I think because you're a bastard, is you um, you humanize the bad guys. Uh-huh. There's that uh, there's that incredible passage where you describe the uh, is it the plaid jacket you describe that oh um, the guy who's who figured out how to make everybody sick on the subway yeah yeah and the plaid jacket he's wearing right. um, as someone who um, thinks about this stuff a lot. Um, you talk about this some in the book, but, but I want to hear you talk about it now. Talk about what you think of the people in the book who were part of these things. Well, that's a really, that's something I wrestled with throughout. And I was trying to actually learn what to think about that by writing the book. So I kept wanting, when I would write about some scientist who was doing some really appalling thing with monkeys or something, um, or people, I would then try to find out biographical details to figure out what kind of person he was. I mean, it was almost always a he. Um, It was always a he. I don't think there were any female germ warfare scientists that I wrote about, not one. And does that mean something? I don't know. So if we have any women listeners, just know that space is free yeah. to be carved out. <laughs> you know, like, Sexist, you know, like, terrible. One of the things we're <laughs> trying to do on our show is invite young girls to grow into women that could be working in germ warfare. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I mean, the, the whole the program ha- was decommissioned by Richard Nixon, of all people. So it's not like we're talking about stuff that's happening now. We're talking about stuff that happened a long time ago. The idea of doing history is to learn from mistakes. But one thing that you have to do in order to learn from mistakes, first you have to know what happened, and that's what the Freedom of Information Act is supposed to do. But then also you have to understand the people. How And people in movies, the bad guys are very often so obviously bad. They usually have you know, a, a German accent or maybe a cruel British accent or something, but they're different, you know, they, they're different. But in, in the world of, let's say the Cold War, there were medical scientists, doctors at Harvard who treated patients, but then they also consulted for Camp Dietrich, later Fort Dietrich, and helped figure out how to make whole millions of people, thousands of people sick, make crops sick in the, in the Soviet Union and in China. So you had the same people who were perfectly decent people in their daily life were then doing things that were really, at this point, 
unthinkably wrong, wrong headed. So how do you understand that kind of person? So I looked up a lot of the people who were working on ways to sicken the Russian um, wheat crop did stuff like grow dahlias and, and they were, they would, they would be judges at orchid competitions and stuff like that. I mean, there, they were people who liked flowers and the, in the case of the chief um, insect scientist in entomological warfare was one of the, things that the United States spent a lot of money on, how to make people sick with ticks and mosquitoes and other things. He was a guy who really liked c collecting butterflies. That's how he got started, you know? Um, and he was, a, he was an Eagle Scout. His name was Dale Jenkins. And he was a smart guy. And suddenly the jobs that were available were, were to, you know, inoculate ticks with rare diseases and see if they could bite either livestock or people and, and, and transmit the diseases to them. So the same person has these two lives. And that's, that's, I don't know, we're thinking about, I guess, is that we're, that it's not easy to, that, that thinking that a person can be, seem perfectly reasonable and nice and well-spoken and highly educated and be really, at times, quite monstrous. Yeah, right. And then create yeah. Lyme disease <laughs> and release <laughs> right. it into the U.S. by accident. <laughs> right. But he liked butterflies. <laughs> it's it's a hard sell. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's the arrogance. The thing is that that's really troubling is is that scientists, because they are so smart and so educated and so well paid and respected, develop a kind of carapace of arrogance that and so they think that they're, that their little critters their bugs their diseases will never escape from a laboratory because their laboratory is so well managed because they've got the best government funds and the best test tubes but you know the history of 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 science is a history of lab accidents and um and I, I talk about this guy the top guy at the National Institute of Health he decided to get interested in Q fever you know, so he went off and looked into Q fever, immediately got sick from it, was sick for a couple of months, got better. Then he decided he would uh, experiment on it back in Washington with his crew of hardy scientists. And they all got sick from it. An elevator operator died. So they built a new building and they were going to really study Q fever. And then there was a uh, the building was flawed and the air went all around the building. And so the guinea pig colony on the, uh, in the attic and the guinea pig colony in the basement, both became sick from Q fever. So, and, and, and more people got sick. So it was just, it's just a, a built in arrogance that, that I think we have to undermine by showing that, that science is science is great and it's beautiful and it's done m many miraculous things, but scientists themselves are people and they get arrogant and they get they get overconfident and they propose things that that are not true or that that, that can't be true. Their their labs are not safe. Is it is it is that driven by politicians more than scientists? Well, that's what I that's what I wanted to ask. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, and I'm, you know, I, I don't, I don't like to. I try to avoid the us and them whenever I can. But your book is about Americans, and um, was there something? Is there something? Is there going to be something that is part of the American culture or character that um, that forces that? How much of it? Is is just people, and how much of it is Americans in the fifties? Mostly, it's just people. I think. I think people people want to people get carried away with things. And they and they try out things. Humans are always inventing neat new neat new things, and then they go too far in a certain direction. And there's a tremendous conspiratorial bent. So in the 50s, the idea was that there was an international communist conspiracy to take over the world. How do you fight that when the communist armies 
are much bigger than the American and allied armies. The only way to fight that is with chemicals and germs. That's what, that's what the Pentagon concluded. And as soon as they made that conclusion that the ad- atom bomb wasn't enough, and then after the, when the Russians got it, they then just went whole hog. They, they made the biological weapons. They gave them an A1 priority rating. And they said, we're going to do this, especially the Air Force. We're going to do this and we're going to do it. We're going to have a killer weapon. We're going to somehow win because we were losing in Korea. How can we win against a numerically superior foe is the question. So and that is a very understandable moment. It was a moment of that is a perennial moment, a moment of panic. If you are a general or a president, President Truman was in charge, and you are suddenly, you've gotten into a war that is that seemed like an easy war and turned out to be a terribly an, an unwinnable war in which your own soldiers were dying and freezing to death in the mountains. That's a moment of panic, of sheer panic. You may be sitting around a fancy table in the Pentagon with every atomic bomb that you that, that are available in the arsenal, but those men were thinking, how do we save face? You know, how do we how do we figure out some way to win? this coming war, this showdown with this band of enemies we call the Kremlin. And then, and they just thought about that all the time until they really made themselves crazy. It's a form of group psychosis, really. And, it, and, and we, we have it now with the, you know, the interna- international terrorism. And there, there's just a desire and also a fear of, a desire for enemies and a fear of enemies. It seems like every every new group of politicians is, they're like kids. They have the same ideas. You know what I mean? Oh, okay, well, let's do this then. And it seems like it's the same ideas that we've tried, you know, in the 30s. But you don't want to, you don't want to ignore the fact that, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I want to have as much sympathy for the devil as possible here because it's difficult. Right. Uh, they believe they were not lying they believe that there was an existential threat to mm-hmm. their way of life and to their friends, family, and, and countrymen. Uh, mm-hmm. that, w- that wasn't bullshit. Um, oh, oh, there was, as you said, a real panic. Um, I don't think that that threat was really there, but I don't know if I would have thought if I were in that room that it wasn't. Right. Well, it, it's it's just this is what you have to think of. Uh, you've got a president who is obsessed with the communists. He's just dropped two bombs on Japan that you know were brand new bombs. Everything is everything's different, and now suddenly you've got the, he's got a new enemy. And for some reason, after many moments of uncertainty. He got us into a war in a little country that very few people knew much about, Korea, that had been artificially divided by a guy working in the Pentagon who just drew a line through the, the country, Korea, and said, okay, north of that will be controlled by Russia, south of that will be controlled by the United States. And that went on for some years and got worse and worse. And then suddenly there was a civil war in Korea. And there were other civil wars and China had fallen. But for some reason, Harry Truman was appalled by this particular one and sent in troops. And and that decision to go in um, was not based on any threat, existential threat to the United States or anything like that. It was based on a, a demon in the freezer of his own mind. It was based on this thing that he'd learned in somewhere in Kansas City that that there are these strange people who are influenced by a demonic for, demonic force called communism and they are going to take our minds over unless we resist them and he, because he was so fixated on that threat he got us into something that was we were in way over our heads and um, and then it became, then it be, then there were the generals sta- sitting around the table saying, 
Well, what do we do? Can we use atomic weapons? Well, there's not really anything to bomb. Let's see. We've burned every village. Um, the North Koreans are living in caves. Well, you know, there's, there's some other weapons in our arsenal. You know, we've got some things going. We've got things in test tubes. You know, I mean, it's just that kind of incremental uh, movement towards something that seems on the face is worth studying because it happens over and over. Yes, uh, I had convinced myself that who the president was didn't make much difference, that there was enough people involved that it didn't really matter that much. And then uh, the combination, the one-two punch of Trump, who really has, it seems to me, made a, uh, made a difference and killed tens of thousands of people and done real damage. And then your description in this book of um, a very few people making a much bigger difference than I want them to make. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a few ads here while we maybe can find out what's going on here. Anyway, as we slowly adjust to a new normal, we still need to be smart about how we do business. Luckily, there's Stamps.com to make things easier. Thousands of small business owners have discovered the benefits of Stamps.com in recent months. They've been able to keep their businesses running and avoid the crowds at the post office, all from their own computers. With Stamps.com, you can print postage on demand and avoid going to the post office, which we all want to do. And you can save money with discounted rates you can't even get at the post office. Stamps.com also offers UPS services with discounts up to 62% and no residential surcharges, which the more you look into this, the more you'll discover that's really, really important. Stamps.com brings all the mailing shipping services you need right now to your computer in the comfort of your home or office. Whether you're a small business sending invoices, an online seller shipping out products, or just working from home and need to mail stuff out, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. You send everything out, Matt, don't you? All the scoop stuff, everything goes with Stamps.com. Absolutely. Stamps.com is a fantastic uh, deal. Sends, I send everything through there. Whether I'm sending a small amount of items or a large amount of items, it's the best option to use for both domestic and international shipping. And Matt Donnelly, you are not good at stuff like this. By stuff <laughs> like this, I no. mean life. Exactly, yeah. And you're able to handle this with no problem. Exactly. Yes, very user-friendly. And, and also, they have a helpline that's also super helpful. Uh, even for a knuckle-dragging ogre like myself. <laughs> right now, our listeners get a special office that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the whole page, and type in... Pen. That's stamps.com. Enter... Pen. pen. Now, uh, we got Lucy Nicotine. Is a company uh, founded by uh, Caltech scientists and former smokers looking for a better and cleaner nicotine alternative. Uh, finally, tobacco alternatives that don't suck. Uh, researched and developed for three years to be made for people, not patients. Uh, Lucy has created a nicotine gum with four milligrams of nicotine that comes in three flavors, wintergreen, cinnamon, pomegranate. Now, I am not a smoker. I am not a nicotine guy. But I did. Take a couple of chews of this, which I can say I tested not the nicotine, but rather the gum. And it, <laughs> uh, uh, it uh, tasted good. Tasted really good. It's 2020. Get rid of your cigarettes, unplug your vape, throw out your dip, and get some Lucy nicotine gum or lozenges. For Penn Sunday School listeners, go to lucy.co and use promo code PEN to get 20% off all products, including gum and lozenges. That's Lucy, L-U-C-Y, dot C-O, not com, C-O, dot C-O, and use promo code P-E-N-N. -N. <laughs> right, that's right. Also, I have to give this disclaimer. Warning, this product contains nicotine derived from tobacco. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Lucy, dot C-O, and be sure to use a promo code PEN. Yeah, we're going to do that. Now, we got something else I don't do much, but I'm just going to read this out loud. Winning season returns at my bookie. Winning season means doubling your first deposit. Winning season means survivor, super contests, and squares. At my booking, winning season means hitting all your parlays and props with your feet up. 
watched your team trounce their rivals, rejoice, it's time to celebrate the NFL season. Invest in your intuition. Use promo code N and double your first deposit. New players get up to $1,000 in free play designed to add more excitement to the sports you love and the games you bet. From live betting to championship futures, every play you want to make is waiting at my bookie. It's simple. Make your picks, win big, collect your cash. Mybookie.ag. That's M-Y-B-O-O-K-I-E dot A-G. Use promo code PEN. And double your first deposit. Your winning season begins today only at mybookie. And now I hope we're back with, uh, with Nicholson. I wanted to ask you um, this question. Um, First of all, if you were uh, in control and people other than me were listening to you, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, what would you do with the Freedom of Information Act? Would you allow everything to be available to people? And what do you think the consequences of that would be? I think governments have to do things in secret. There's no way to stop governments from doing things in secret. The question is, what? how do you help historians understand what happened uh, several generations ago is what I'm thinking about. It's an easier problem. The problem of whether we can subpoena, or not subpoena, but request the minutes of a cabinet meeting from, let's say, two months ago, that's a really difficult question because People want to be able to talk freely. So I'm not going to even look at that question. That, that's a, that's, that's, I think there are times when we need to know everything and that there's way too much secrecy now. But that's not the question that I, I think there is an easier to solve problem that I'm writing about, which is what happened 75, 70, 60, 50 years ago. And I think that those secrets have have changed. They've moldered. They've they've disintegrated into interesting bits of studyable past. And they're no longer desperately important things that are attached to particular human beings who are alive and who would, would be embarrassed. So that part of it, I think, is, is actually uh, both more important in a way, because we need to know what happened in the past in order to not make the same mistakes, but also an easier question to solve. Everything that's older than 50 years, I think, should be available to anybody who wants to look at it. And uh, and I don't mean available in the sense of redactions, because that, that, is a, that is a way of torturing us all. You've seen the Mueller report, you know it. I mean, it's, you just can't figure out what's going on because there are these big black shapes all over the place. I mean, everything should be available to any citizen because why? Why is it so important? It's, it's important because we have a very distorted version of what happened in, in, in the lifetimes of our own grandparents, you know. We just we don't actually know the whole story because we have this very sanitized PR, you know, kind of uh, slanted version of events. And we need to know what happened because we're living through stuff now that's just unbelievable. And a lot of what they're doing now, I mean, take Mike Pompeo. What is he doing? He takes down one of the binders and looks at what the CIA did in Guatemala and says, oh, that might be interesting to try. They're, they're trying the same things that were tried in 1952, 53, 54, all over again, because the full story of what happened then has not been told. And so he thinks, well, maybe it would be a good, good idea to try it. So my idea is open everything up before 1950, and then after 1950, we can talk. And I, and I think all we would have to do, all I need is $20 million dollars, to sue the government, and then that wouldn't take twenty million, but but sue sue the government under the Freedom of Information Act and the First Amendment, because basically, if you how can you how can you say what's true or what's not true? How can you express yourself if you don't know what's going on? So under under various laws, you 
you sue the sue the government for everything that's over over the fifty years, and that takes maybe a million dollars, right? And then the next forty nine million is scanning everything and putting it up so <laughs> anyone can look at it, right? Or the next the next nineteen million, I should say, right? And I don't think so. It's not that expensive. It's just it should be done immediately. <laughs> and what do you think? Uh, would be uh, uh, changes, negative and positive, that, that would make if we had that information? Well, we need to be humbled, okay? We, we have a sense that we have been, the, that we've done all these great and noble things, and we have. The great and noble things we've done are in the, in the areas of comedy. Nobody, I mean, you're, you're part of this, Penn, actually, is, is nobody does stuff the way... Americans do where 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 you take something that is, uh, say, prestidigitational in your case, and you twist it so that it's also funny. Comedy is our greatest achievement. Sitcoms, music is totally we're off the charts with music. Movies, that is what th that's the core set of talents that the United States, not the novel, because I mean I'm in the wrong, but it's just it's not it has it's it there were some good moments, but but. Let's let's just you know shout out to the nineteenth century British novel, but the but we did stuff that was really good. What we didn't do well is we messed up whole countries all over the world for, for a long time. Ever since the Second World War, we've been meddling with other countries. That's a bad idea. It never has worked out. There is not one. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm just going to be insanely blanket pronouncing here there's not one good inter intervention that we've had not one single good intervention there's no there's no happy story about going into a, another country and tinkering with its government without asking permission there's no there's that hasn't happened so the cuban stories are amazing really i was in cuba two years ago for that one hour when we were allowed to go right and and the cuban story of what happened shocked me but even what they said happened was not even close to what uh what you've exposed through the freedom freedom of information act uh it's unbelievable what we've done it's embarrassing it's horrifying well I, and i think that you know it's not you don't want to just cause embarrassment and horror but you want that to be the prelude to something else which is a, which is humility which is and it, it is to me. I didn't know the story either. But and thank goodness for um, the movie JFK. You may have problems with that movie, but it caused this this whole JFK Secrets Act to happen. And, and these these acts of Congress are like vacuum cleaners, and they vacuum clean up all kinds of documents that have nothing to do in this case with the JFK assassination. And what they had were documents having to do with the treatment of Cuba. And there was one paragraph, and I think this is what you're talking about. There was one paragraph in one document where they said, what we will do to undermine the Cuban economy is destroy the Cuban sugarcane crop. And the way to do that is to sicken the workers with some kind of disease. And uh, that was blacked out ever since 1960, whatever it was, 1961, 62, when Bobby Kennedy and and Lansdale, this cold warrior, came up with it, and and it was held, it was kept a secret all the way through till 2017. So um, suddenly that was removed, and you could see that that's what they were talking about was they were discussing the possibility of sickening the sugarcane workers, and then they came up with an alternative idea, which was to introduce a disease of sugarcane itself to sicken the sugarcane crop to undermine the Cuban economy. And that's why Castro went on the radio saying, we have great fears that the American CIA has introduced these plagues into our country. And he was absolutely telling the truth. And we just have to face it. This country tried to mess with that with that island, because it was so close, so upsettingly close, and yet under a different political system, that they introduced several 
diseases of human beings and of of crops in order to mess with them. The tobacco disease, for instance. How insane is that to try to get a country to fold? You know, to do to to get to create chaos in a country by destroying its cash crop, tobacco. Why would you? Why would you think that's a good idea? Honestly, even if you were a person who hated who hated communism in Cuba, you'd think that's just that's just dark. You'd also think that that's not far from us, and we're going to get those diseases. Everything that we do there is coming to our shores, and in a very short time. Well, right. If you decide, okay, in our laboratory, we're going to cook up the most virulent form of X disease, and we're going to make it resistant to all known remedies, and, and we're going to make it very catching, very contagious. Um, and then, so you have strain number A1236, and you then introduce, try to introduce that disease into a foreign country, of course, you're going to get blowback. Of course, people in this country are going to get sick. And that happened over and over again. The most spectacular example, which I don't think anybody else has written about, is the attempt to destroy the entire Russian wheat crop. Oh, they had they had balloons that were floating gondolas filled with wheat disease, a certain fungus of wheat. And they experimented on this for years. Um, but in 1950, when they first were experimenting with this new and highly virulent strain of wheat stem rust, there was a gigantic epidemic of wheat stem rust in Minneapolis and 14 other states in the Midwest. The entire Durham wheat crop was destroyed by this effort to destroy the Russian wheat crop. The first victims of any weapon system are the people who are who it domestically who are it's it's tested on, and this is why I write books and don't talk about this because it obviously gets me upset and <laughs> I'm feeling upset and worried and 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 this stuff is all a long time ago so you know but it is stuff we could learn from now and I think I think that's the key you know when I uh uh I, I wrote to you uh, about this privately but it's 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 I think um uh, worth saying here you know I went to you Samrid uh yeah yeah. And uh, I got a uh, a tour with a general there right. who was uh, with us and our whole crew. As I like to point out, you two invited our whole crew to go see their concert, <laughs> and two people showed up. Uh, you, Samarid, invited our whole crew to come see the labs, and the entire crew showed up, which tells you a lot about the Penn and Teller crew. And um, what I witnessed there was really smart, hardworking people mm -hmm. uh, who seemed very, very kind. I got to see the eight ball that you talk about where they mm -hmm. put mostly seven-day Adventists in and, and, and aerosoled viruses to use them as human guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. I saw where they're working with Ebola in the labs. I saw what they call the slammer, which is where they keep stuff. And um, when 9-11 happened, mm -hmm. um, I wrote to the general and, uh, cause everybody was saying terrorists are now going to do biological and chemical. And he wrote back to me and said, terrorists will never do biological because it's not what they want to accomplish. In a war, you want to blow shit up mm. and you want to blow up the biggest, most phallic thing you can. You want to blow up the world trade center. There is nothing that's good in propaganda with giving an entire country diarrhea. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he said, uh, if you wanted to get Saddam Hussein, he said, you can talk to me and our guys can make everybody too sick to fight. We can go in and get them. We can take them out. And within 24 hours, almost everybody will have recovered fully. He said, there is a real humanitarian way we can use biological weapons. Mm -hmm. um, he said the reason terrorists don't use them is because no one likes the guys that do it. They're creepy guys. It's like bringing Woody Allen into a, uh, into a sexy group of uh, fighters. And um, I found that argument pretty compelling 
and I asked you about it, and you talked about how uh, even if all of that were true, everything you're talking about is about during peacetime. Is that right? Well, that's part of it. But the other part is just that the way that the Pentagon actually thinks is, as you say, it's mostly blowing shit up. But the way the CIA was thinking, and they were in parallel, was how do you do things secretly that will never be traced back to the United States? So the plans that were in place, that were thought about, that were discussed, had to do, and say were tried out in Cuba, for instance, were ways to make a country sick that was not we were not at war with, that was not actually doing terrorist things against the United States, but was simply considered an enemy. So we're, ta we're talking about an additive proposition. We've got all these weapons. We've got high explosive bombs. We've got fire bombs. We've got atom bombs. We've got every kind of mine and battleship and everything you can imagine. And that's all the military. But we also want stealth weapons. We want weapons that can't be attributed to American action. And so the, what the biological effort, a lot of the biological effort was, was to make things that couldn't be traced. So, so and all of this is true um, then. So after 1971, when the biological warfare stocks were mostly destroyed, um, the place that you toured, the eight ball and, it's called U.S. Amrid, but I mean, it's basically Fort Detrick. It's the same place, the same buildings. They still have the Anthrax Hotel there and all that. It's, 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 it has been repurposed, and it, it, it is looking into how to prevent diseases. And, and so it, it's what the critics of Fort Detrick were saying was, take these scientists who are working on how to kill people with germs and give them the same amount of money, but ask them to come up with vaccines. And it's sort of worked. Um, it's just that you can't help but get a kind of military defensive flavor to a place. And maybe you picked up on this when you looked at it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a place, it's a, it's a military installation. It's still got a guy in charge who's a general or, a, or at least, a, you know, probably a general. And the military effort to hide things and, uh, for instance, waste. I mean, you know, Fort Detrick had to be closed down because its sewage system had a fire or something. And it, it's one of the most polluted groundwater. They had every, can you imagine the number of different kinds of germs that were flowing out of this waste system? Unbelievable. So it's not, it wasn't necessarily a good idea to continue Fort Detrick, I, ha I can't agree with you about the humanity of using, of talking about uh, weapons that make people sick um, as being more humane, because it's actually not that, it's actually the plans were we will blow cities up and when, when people are staggering around in the ruins of these cities, we will completely paralyze the medical establishment in that country by also making everyone sick. So it was, it was part of a larger plan, at least the war plans that I've seen from the 50s and 60s. Well, that's, uh, uh, that's what's so remarkable is having this conversation unstuck in time. You know, I, I got to see mm -hmm. uh, completely from their point of view. I mean, albeit for, you know, five hours, Mm -hmm. And then he gave me three books to read, which I which I read, um, and then to have this, you know, in in my in my personal world, your book is an answer to that, and uh, it's one of the reasons it was uh, so incredibly um, powerful to me because in not not in reality, but emotionally, uh, I had met. And broken bread with, in a very large sense, the kind of people you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I found that very, very emotional. And um, I don't want to give the impression that I'm disagreeing with you. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to hear you 
speak about that because um, it's very difficult, very difficult to meet some, to meet people one on one Mm -hmm. and to be welcomed by them and to be treated with respect by them Mm -hmm. and then to uh, pull back enough to morally judge what part of history they may be part of. Well, right, um, and you, you, but you have to also really say that the man that you were talking to is not a Cold War exactly. germ warrior. He's a, he's from a new, he's yeah. pa- after the divide. But mm-hmm. the this book, Baseless, is called Baseless because there was an actual Air Force program called Project Baseless, and the aim was to was to achieve an Air Force wide capability in biological and chemical weapons, quote, at the earliest possible date. So we're talking about an entire gigantic government agency, the Air Force, the most prestigious agency after World War II, the one that the miracle bombers that won the war with Germany and Japan. So those people had decided that the most important thing they could possibly do was get an Air Force-wide capability in chemical and biological weapons, and they called it baseless. Now, why did they call it baseless? Because they built deniability into it, especially in the case of biological weapons. There was this sort of stealth factor. You could drop insects places or strange powders, feathers dusted with crop diseases or diseases of livestock, and nobody would know. And that was that was the new and exciting flavor of 1951, 52, 53. That was what was getting people excited. And that was where the millions were, of dollars were being spent because the atomic bomb was old news, you know, and they knew that they couldn't, it couldn't win wars against armies because it's very hard to blow up armies with atomic weapons. You only can blow up cities, really. So we needed a way to make armies sick. And so that, I'm just saying that, that, that whole way of thinking I think we need to recognize was part of of our own history, and we need to deal with that. But it also is very different, I hope, very different from the way of thinking that's going on now in Fort Detrick. Well, I wanted to I wanted to ask you that um, with, uh, and I don't want to get uh, it gets very complicated here because uh, because we have Trump and his anti deep state. And Mm -hmm. QAnon, and Mm -hmm. we have a president who is at war with his own uh, his own intelligence, uh, (laughs) or lack of same. (laughs) And uh, uh, do you believe uh, that most of this did stop fifty years ago? I I do. I on on the other. I know one secret thing that uh, is that came out of the book that I was writing, finally a document appeared, which was a deception document. It was, it was a plan to, dis- to trick the Russians into thinking that the Americans had a more powerful biological weapon than we actually had. And it was something that came from 1949. And there were several of these efforts, even after 1971, when everything supposedly stopped, Richard Nixon said, no more, destroy all the stocks. Even after that, there were efforts by the CIA and FBI to trick double agents into to release fake documents and trick the Soviets into thinking that the Americans had continued this very aggressive program developing anthrax missiles and stuff like that. And that actually created a kind of Soviet American biological arms race. So there was a gigantic gurgling marsh monster of bio warfare innovation that developed in the Soviet Union in response to what was actually misinformation or disinformation planted by American agencies in their wisdom. So I, I, um, I guess it's a long way of saying nobody is now I think planning to infect the world with anthrax or brucellosis or 
uh, anything in between. Q fever, all these mis- flus and things, but they are still fascinated by them. So every country has these laboratories. And the labor- a lot of the laboratories are actually doing contract work for the National Institute of Health. And the National Institute of Health wants, wants to believe that they have to be on guard against terrorist activity. And so they feel that they must study all of these germs and find out if the germs can be made to be more infectious and to jump from species from, from, let's say, civets to people and things. So the Americans have paid for a lot of very risky research all over the world in which diseases that infected one species were tricked into making human cells in petri dishes or lab animals that are simulating humans sick. That's a strange situation. That's something that hasn't stopped. The research into into very crazy diseases that they think have terroristic interest continues. And Fort Detrick is concerned in that. They want to yes. defend against that. And actually, I think it's it's a symptom of their own fascination with, I mean, it's, how could it not be, if you're a person my grandfather was a pathologist, all right? So I, I I know this because I was at the dinner table when he talked about the human liver for an hour. You know, th- this this is a guy who loved diseases. My own grandfather made help. I, 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 I proofread his scientific papers, fungal diseases of various kinds, horrible diseases. Um, and I know what he's, that he was telling me the truth when he said, diseases are so interesting. I love diseases. He really wanted to understand them. The way to understand them is to cultivate them and to infect creatures with them. That's what you have to do. And, and that's what pathologists do who study diseases. They're fascinated by the dangerousness of it. And I, I just don't, I don't think that their, their energies are being well used in studying these extremely hazardous diseases and making them worse. And I think that we may be paying the price for that right now. Well, I want to uh, talk about that, and I want to talk about that when Wednesday comes around. Uh, We're talking to uh, Nicholson Baker. Uh, The newest book is Baseless, My Search for Secrets in the Ruins of the Freedom of Information Act. Nicholson Baker, but you don't have to remember the name of that book. Because any book you buy with the name Nicholson Baker on it, you will love. They are the best books available. Uh, I have read every one of them, and uh, I could talk about every one of them with Nicholson for hours and hours. Uh, just uh, one of the uh, one of the people I'm most happy to be alive at the same time as. And uh, we'll do more, do more with Nicholson Baker, but for right now, that was Penn Sunday School. Cha cha cha. You become naked. Boy, you know, Godot, we got to get to human smoke. I- I'd like to talk about you and I. <laughs> Maybe we- this is all that the show should be from now on. It's just talking to and about Nicholson Baker. I don't know. And most important, you know, we love you.